I want to direct your attention to the fact that sometimes we need to delve into subjects that at first glance are uncomfortable. This is vital to our intellectual and our emotional and our spiritual development. Sometimes we need to face square on topics, issues that we would rather not address. The message today bears the title, A Personality Profile of Lucifer. Now, that is a title that I want to tell you at the beginning. The message will be less spooky than that sounds, but more diabolical than it sounds. Because indeed, something extremely diabolical is going on real time on the stage of human history down through the ages to this very present moment. And we're going to make an attempt to psychoanalyze the demonic mind, to delve into what's going on in the thinking and feeling process of Lucifer himself. Now, I want to begin by telling you something about myself going back to the early stages of my life. As a kid, straight up through my teenage years, I had an academic obsession with just one thing, song lyrics. Not math, not history, not social studies, just song lyrics. I had a pretty large vinyl collection, that should date me, although vinyl's coming back. And I bought album after album after album, stacking them up in my bedroom for one reason because I wanted to put the records on the turntable and not just listen to music in an abstract sense, but to pour over the lyrics of the songs. That was my thing, that was my obsession. What are these artists, these poets, what are they trying to say? What are the stories that they're telling? What are the things that they are trying to tell me in these songs. Now, you need to understand something else about my childhood, and that is that I was raised in an extremely secular home, what might be regarded as a postmodern orientation to reality. God was no mo nowhere on the radar of anybody in my home. I had never seen a Bible. I didn't know what the Ten Commandments were. If you would have said to me, hey, Ty, have you ever read the book of Genesis? I would have said to you, I know the rock band Genesis, but not the book of Genesis. Although the rock band Genesis was named after the book of Genesis. And there were some spiritual tendencies that were present in rock music that I began to detect, but I thought it was all fiction. I thought these are just storytellers, these are entertainers, these are people who are telling us things that are in the form of art, and their art is, by and large, fiction. But there were songs that stood out to me, and one of them was a song that bore the title, Sympathy for the Devil, by the Rolling Stones. Now, as a teenager, listening to this song, again, I just thought, fiction. But there's something about the song that is extremely fascinating. The song seems to be telling a story, the story of an actual personal being who is active on the stage of human history while being undetected, present and active but not visible, not detected. And in the song, the story is being told in the first person. Somebody is addressing us as Mick Jagger sings the song, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. At that point in the song, I was thinking as a teenager, and anybody would be thinking, well, Mick Jagger, maybe he's giving his own personality profile. Maybe, maybe he's talking about himself. Maybe Mick Jagger is a man of wealth and taste. But as the song continues to unfold, something fascinating happens. I've been around for a long, long year, and I've stolen many a man's soul and faith. 
hmm, maybe not Mick Jagger. Maybe somebody else is speaking to us in the song. I made sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. And this was a biblical allusion, right? To the story of Jesus in the Gospels where the Roman ruler washed his, he says, I wash my hands of the fate of this innocent man that was about to be crucified. Here, whoever is addressing us in the song, apparently not Mick Jagger, because this individual claims to have been alive and active and present at the crucifixion of Jesus, playing a role, prompting the mind of Pilate, the Roman ruler, on that occasion to wash his hands of the blood of this innocent man. Well, the song goes on, and then fast forwards in history to another historical event, from the crucifixion to the Russian Revolution. I stuck around St. Petersburg, that's Russia, when I saw it was time for a change. I killed the czar and his ministers, Anastasia screamed in vain. Google it, these are historical events that are going down on the stage of human history that whoever it is that is introducing himself to us in the song is laying claim to have involvement with. I rode a tank and held a general's rank when the blitzkrieg raged and the bodies stank. Again, we're at the Russian Revolution. Please allow me to introduce myself. Pleased to meet you, excuse me. Hope you guess my name. But here's the language I want you to catch most of all. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. What am I up to? What's my agenda? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I pursuing? Just as every cop's a criminal and all the sinner's saint, as heads is tails, just call me Lucifer because I'm in need of some Restraint, And now, the personage that is introducing himself to us in the song divulges his identity with a name. I, who was present with Pilate at the crucifixion, I, who was present and active at the Russian Revolution, pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name. My name is Lucifer, Pleased to meet you, hope you guess my name, but what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. Lucifer in the song is portrayed as a personal being who is active on the stage of human history. Now this is in contrast to a popularized notion regarding Lucifer that is brought to view in a lot of literature in the last hundred years or so, but specifically the 1995 bestseller, The Lucifer Principle by Howard Bloom, in which Bloom suggests that this notion of Lucifer is not a historical figure, not a personal being, but merely a principle that is active in human psychology and genetics. And so Bloom suggests that evil is a byproduct of nature's strategies for creation and that it is woven into our most basic biological fabric. Now this is the premise of the book and this depersonalizing philosophy of evil. And the reason why this is a crucial development in human thinking and human philosophy in, in human scientific observation because he's dealing mostly in the book with biology, genetics, and he's suggesting that every human being is moved upon by survival of the fittest principles that can tip any human being in the direction of quote unquote good or evil, but that evil itself is a principle, it's not a personal reality, either to a historical figure called Lucifer or 
to us as human beings. And essentially what we have in this philosophical approach to evil is that evil is not a moral principle that shows up in free will actions, but rather evil is simply one of the laws of evolution. And because it is merely one of the laws of evolution, we have before us this idea of depersonalization that you in the popular lingo of our time will encounter when people say things like, you know, the universe will help you out. The universe is in your favor. I, 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 I'm praying to the universe or popularized in the Star Wars movies, may the force be with you, the force, the energy field that defines reality in an ultimate sense. May the force <clears throat> be with you. But to depersonalize Lucifer is to depersonalize evil. And wh why is this significant? Well, to depersonalize Lucifer, to strip Lucifer of personal identity, of personhood, and make Lucifer out to be merely a principle of the evolutionary process is to render evil itself void of any kind of real moral and personal significance. You have no more control over the choices that you make than stars have over the circuit they orbit in. Everything is predetermined because everything via the Big Bang 13.9 billion years ago, everything is natural process. Everything is determined. There is no evil in the moral sense. All there is is evolutionary process. But to depersonalize God in this philosophical worldview is to also depersonalize good. So a man never falls in love. A, a woman never falls in love. Love itself is a product of the evolutionary process. Love in this worldview is in fact, love in this worldview is evolutionary process operating at its highest level of deception. I love you because of what I subconsciously sense I will get out of the relationship. But altruism, that is a completely selfless and other-centered love, is a religious philosophical myth in this worldview. There is no love anywhere in the universe, and definitely not in your own heart and life. You don't love your children. You are evolutionarily bent on their survival and that's all there is to it. So in this worldview, good and evil are depersonalized. And that equates to a net effect in which there is no such thing as personal moral responsibility. I am not responsible for my behavior towards you. I simply am how I am by the dictates of natural process and I wish you well. <laughs> Hopefully, I will not be the stronger who will pounce upon you in any given relational dynamic and negate your well-being in favor of mine. May the best man win. But according to the song, Sympathy for the Devil, whether you regard it as fiction or whether you regard it as a kind of telecommunications process through a rock star from a supernatural being, whatever your choice may be, the song Sympathy for the Devil appears to be telling a story. And the story that it's telling is that there is an actual personal being called Lucifer who has personal attributes, who thinks thoughts and feels feelings and performs actions. This personal being, according to the song, is active though invisible or undetected to human senses down through human history. Now, that's the claim of the song, but it's also the claim of the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative is one in which good is a 
person, a personalized reality. Evil is a personalized reality. Moral responsibility moves omnidirectional from every individual. And in history, we have the activities of a personal devil, Lucifer, Satan. Watch as the text unfolds and we will now psychoanalyze the Luciferian mind. War broke out in heaven. War broke out in heaven. Michael, note the name Michael, and his angels, apparently according to this narrative, personal beings. Michael and his angels fought. Well, how did they fight? What kinds of weapons? What kinds of strategies? They fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So what happened? The next verse says, so the great dragon was, note the language, cast out that serpent of old. Now we have a historical reference. This is the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, written in the first century, and it is referring back to of old. Some figure, some personage active in history called that serpent from a long time ago. That serpent who was active on the stage of human history a long time ago, of old, called now, the symbolism of dragon is deciphered for us, called the devil and Satan. Called the devil and Satan. Who, note the language, it will become important momentarily, who deceives the whole world. He, the devil, Satan, the dragon, was cast to the earth. Cast to the earth. Planet earth in the vast universe becomes the battleground upon which this fight, this war, ensues, and his angels were cast out with him. Again, the implication to the earth. So we have a war, we have a battle that is taking place between Satan and Michael. Now in scripture, you need to understand that always, without exception, when a name is used, the name has significance regarding the character, personality, or identity of the named individual. There is no name in the Bible that does not mean something with regards to personhood, character, identity. Satan is a name that means adversary or enemy. Michael is a name, the definition of which we will discover shortly. These two individuals are the key characters in Revelation 12 that are at war with one another. But the question begs to be answered, what kind of war is this? Again, going back to verse seven, it simply states war broke out in heaven. At that point in the English usage of the word war, we might picture some kind of physical battle or tussle of some kind. Maybe angels in midair with lightning bolts or laser beams shooting out of their fingers at one another. Maybe a heavenly wrestling match of some kind in which finally Michael got a good stranglehold on the devil and threw him physically from the heavenly realm and he landed in a puff of dust on planet earth on the terra firma under our feet. We might with the word war conjure in our minds an extremely physical definition of war. Guns, bombs, tanks, explosions, swords, knives, whatever, some kind of physical battle. But the word in the Greek is polemos, from which we get English words like poles, like North Pole, South Pole, the polarity on the battery in your vehicle, the negative and the positive poles. The word also is the Greek word from which we get words like politics. The idea here is that the war is political in nature. When political opponents wage war against one another, they don't do it by challenging the 
incumbent or the up and coming challenger for the presidential election. Joe Biden is not going to challenge Donald Trump to a duel. Donald Trump is not going to challenge Joe Biden to a sword fight. Are you tracking with me? How are they going to wage their war? They're going to stand in podiums and they're going to shoot what at one another? Words. They're going to formulate sentences out of their mouths to misrepresent or misrepresent <clears throat> or attempt to represent their opponent and represent or misrepresent themselves. A political war is composed of ideological concepts flowing back and forth. Representation versus misrepresentation. Representation versus misrepresentation. And the job of the viewer, of the voter, is to lean in and try to discern who's telling the truth about what and whom. So the word war, polemos, is a word that indicates not a physical war, not to say that there's not a physical dimension to the war between good and evil, but what this scripture is telling us is that a political war erupted in heaven. Don't picture Lucifer shooting laser beams out of his fingertips at Michael, at God, at the good angels. Picture Lucifer formulating ideas, suggesting concepts, saying, hey, but have you ever thought of this? What about that? Insinuating, planting seeds of doubt saying, I know, I know, I know, I know. God seems to have our best interests at heart, but have you noticed? God's kind of, I don't know. It's, now, I may be wrong, of course. Don't, don't hold me to that. And it's, it's, definitely don't tell the Lord, oh, wait, he knows everything. He's overhearing my insinuations. And so the devil in this war is planting seeds of doubt, he is, he is deceiving, and that's what the text tells us. I told you to hang on to two words, war and deceives. War broke out in heaven, the text says, Satan deceives the whole world. The word deceives in the text is a fascinating Greek word, planeo, which means, <clears throat> excuse me, to lead astray with arguments. Not to get behind somebody and force them in the direction you want them to go. Not to hold them at gunpoint, but to lead people astray by the speaking of words that are calculated to misrepresent and to create a web of lies and confusion. So, in gospel, in, in Paul's understanding of the gospel, something is happening. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Again, we're probing into the Luciferian mind. We're psychoanalyzing from a biblical standpoint what the devil is thinking, what's going on in the devil's head. Paul says it this way. If our gospel, that word means good news, if our gospel, thank you, <clears throat> Apparently, I talk too much. If our gospel is, note the language, veiled. Veiled. What, what happens when something is veiled? You don't see it. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Those who are perishing, those who are involved in a process of decline. Those who are perishing. Notice this who do not believe, pause, believe. What faculty or what part of your humanity do you use to believe something? You don't believe with your elbow. You don't believe with your left knee. You believe with your mind, with your thinking, with your rational process. You believe with your heart, with your emotional process. And the best beliefs are an intersection between intellect and emotion, where you feel the gravity of what you believe. Now, here we have those to whose minds the gospel has been veiled and they're not believing. 
they are not engaging in a rational, emotional process of apprehending reality. Let's say it that way. They're seeing things in a skewed light. They do not believe lest the light, pause again, the word light in scripture always invokes the idea of mental and emotional illumination. It is a synonym for truth symbolically, metaphorically, light equates to truth or an accurate rendering of reality, okay? That's what light is. But these people, their minds are blinded, their, 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 their hearts are veiled so that they're not believing the light of the good news, the gospel, of the glory. The word glory here is, is a very fascinating Greek word, doxa, D-O-X-A, which literally means to radiate the glory of Christ, the, the radiant beauty of Christ. The whole point is that the gospel would be veiled to the understanding of people so that the gospel of the glory of Christ is not known, seen, processed in the thinking and feeling process. Christ, who is the image of God, lest that knowledge of the glory of Christ should shine on them. The God of this age, Paul says in the text, that is another term in scripture for Lucifer, his entire objective is to veil or blind or block our vision of the beauty of God's character. If you wanna know what's going on at the deep inner core of the Luciferian mind, the devil's M.O., modus operandi, is to spin a web of theological, philosophical, and scientific lies to lead people to see God in a false light and to not behold the beauty of the character of God as revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. So summarizing what we've discovered so far, because we're looking at a lot of ideas here and summarizing is a helpful thing to do when I'm standing and talking and you're sitting and listening. So summarizing, Lucifer, according to Revelation 12, traffics in politics and deception. Politics, not politics in the sense that we see unfolding you know, among nations and political candidates. The devil is a politician in the sense that he is campaigning against the character of God. Are you tracking with me? He is campaigning against the character of God by means of deception, by misrepresenting the character of God. Now, with that background in mind, we're going to add two additional characteristics to the Luciferian psychology. And we're going to draw these from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Now, a little bit of background on Isaiah 14 real quick. If you go to Isaiah 14 and you start with verse one, you realize that you are reading a historical description by the prophet Isaiah of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. This is overtly, clearly stated in verses one through 11. The person that is being addressed by the prophet Isaiah is the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And the first 11 verses are commentary on the diabolical, cruel actions of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. But there is a characteristic of Bible prophecy, Bible poetry, Bible symbolism that you need to keep in mind when you're studying the Bible. And that is that oftentimes a prophet will begin by poetically describing earthly events and then transition to cosmic events. And this is what we see taking place in Isaiah chapter 14. The king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is being addressed and then the prophet shifts gears and goes into a revelation that is of cosmic proportions. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, exclamation point. Wow, what a downfall. 
You were so high, now you're so low. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, now. By the way, this is the only time in Scripture that the word, the proper name, Lucifer, occurs. The single, solitary time that we encounter the word. The word literally means light bearer. God chose the name. It's a, it's a, it's a nice name, although nobody names their children Lucifer. Just like nobody names their children anymore Adolf. Lucifer is a name that has gone down in human history in infamy. Lucifer was the son of the dawn, the son of the morning. He was the angel first created by God as kind of like the template for all the angels that would be, would be created afterwards, and he was the appointed leader of the angels. Throughout Scripture, listen carefully, throughout Scripture, angels are associated metaphorically with stars throughout Scripture because they are, they are luminous creatures. They are beings that, that, that give off the light of the knowledge of God's character. They have fellowship with God, and they come out of that fellowship to, to cross-pollinate their knowledge of God's character with one another, so to speak, and to reveal the beauty of God's character. This is what angels do, and this is why the word angel means messenger. Literally, an angel is a conduit of the knowledge of God. An angel is called upon to reveal the character of God, to, to illuminate or enlighten minds regarding the character of God. Now, Lucifer held the highest position. He was the, the quintessential angel, the quintessential messenger. He was the ultimate light bearer, so to speak, right? And as Lucifer began to turn his gaze inward and contemplate his own beauty, something began to happen. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Notice that in the poem, Lucifer is said to have fallen and become active in human history among nations. He is using his influence to weaken nations on planet Earth. You remember the song, Sympathy for the Devil, which brought to our attention that the devil lays claim to being present and active during the Russian Revolution. And in that sense, we have before us, again, the same story on replay that is over and over again in Scripture, and that is that we live in a hyper-personal world. Evil is a personal reality that comes from the moral choices of persons. And at the pinnacle of evil personhood is Lucifer. He is what we sometimes, we use this language, he is what we sometimes call the origin of evil. He is the original one from whence evil proceeded. People say, wow, did God create the devil? No, God created Lucifer. Lucifer created the devil by a process of free will action. Just like you right now and I right now, you as a free moral agent are right now this moment in a becoming process. Metamorphosis is always happening. Nobody is ever, ever, ever stagnant. Status quo does not exist with human personality and character. You are also, you are always in the process of becoming incrementally relational maneuver by relational maneuver, step by step, inch by inch, word by word, thought by thought, feeling by feeling, action by action. You and I are always in the process of incrementally becoming what we were not just moments ago. This is called sometimes personality or character development. Modern science has demonstrated for us unequivocally that there is a plasticity to human brains and minds. Brain being the physical organ and the mind being the invisible reality that occurs from the brain. We're plastic, we're Plato, we're always in the process of change. From that, we can deduce that it is possible to be good and to become evil by one's own choice. 
Are you tracking with me? It is possible to have given oneself over to evil and to become good by a series of choices. We are plastic. The devil was not made by God. Lucifer was made by God, and by a series of free will choices, he became the devil. He became the devil. But the question is before us, how, how, how? How did this exalted being of luminous light become, how did Lucifer become Satan? Well, the text goes on and tells us exactly what happened. It tracks with us the thinking process. For or because, because you have said in your heart. So there was some kind of internal dialogue going on. Before he started uttering sentences and words to misrepresent the character of God, before he began to say things out loud, he began to think things privately. He began to say things in his internal dialogue like this. I will, note the language, ascend into heaven. Notice that in the poem, in the song, there is a reaching upward in the Luciferian psychology. I will ascend into heaven. I will, note the word, exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will occupy the pinnacle of reality. I'm going up. I am upwardly mobile. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. And then this, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. A congregation is a grouping of individuals. A congregation is a community. It's not an individual, it's a group. And he says, I will sit. The word sit here implies the idea of enthronement. I will be enthroned. I will sit on the mount. A mountain is a high place. It has a peak. This is all very poetic, but it's revealing concrete realities. I will sit on the mount of the congregation where people assemble. Some versions render this part of the text, I will sit in the, in the high place of the assembly. In scripture, the mountain represents the throne of God, the pinnacle of governmental rule, all right? So he's saying, I will ascend, I will exalt in the previous text, and now I will enthrone myself amidst the entire assembly as the center of attention. I am my favorite person. Everybody should look at and give their attention to me in adoration. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest sides of the north. I'm going way up. I'm going to go so far up, in fact, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here's the extremely revealing part of the Luciferian psychology. I will be like the Most High. And this, Sigmund Freud would be happy to interpret for us, is what we call in psychology projection. Notice the process of the devil's thinking. Follow it very carefully. I will ascend, exalt. I will aim for the highest position imaginable. I will be like God. The implication is that Lucifer is beginning to imagine in his own self-deluded state that God occupies the highest place by self-exaltation. He is in the text equating God with self-exaltation or selfishness. He's saying, I'm going up, 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 I'll be like God. God occupies the position by self-exaltation, so the only way for me to get there is for me to exalt myself. Self-exaltation, the devil begins to make himself believe, is what actuates the character of God. In other words, you could say this in reverse. The devil is not just equating God with selfishness. He is, in fact, denying the existence of love 
as the core reality of God's character. He's saying God is selfish, God is not love. God does not have my best interest at heart, he doesn't have your best interest at heart. This was the insinuation, this was, this was the accusation. God occupies the highest place by self-will, by self-exaltation. Well, if you read the whole biblical narrative, you discover that God quite frankly is willing to abdicate the throne become the lowest of the low, and be crucified. God does not occupy the highest place in the universe by sheer power, but by virtue of his intrinsic goodness and love. Those who praise God, those who exalt him, do so not under threat, but under infatuation. They are in love with him, and the devil begins to aspire to the position of God while simultaneously rejecting the character of God. He wants the position God occupies, but he doesn't want to love like God loves. Ellen White, over 100 years ago, an author that some of you are familiar with, Ellen White gets to the heart of the matter when she says this, and I'm quoting, though unable to expel God from his throne, Satan has charged God with satanic attributes and has claimed the attributes of God as his own. Again, this is a, you know, this is post-Freud. Well, no, actually this statement was made pre-Freud and this is a description theologically of projection. She goes on and says this, check this out. He, that's the devil, misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. Notice the language. The devil's game is to misrepresent God by attributing to God the desire for self-exaltation. And finally this, with his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving creator Wow, thus, or in this way, this is his MO. This is how he operates. Thus he deceives angels, deceived angels, thus he deceived men or humans. What is he up to? What's going on? He is misrepresenting the character of God by a very, very diabolical means. The nature of Lucifer's game, to quote again the song, the nature of Lucifer's game is to make God look like himself and to make himself look like God. To completely distort the reality field of human perception so that we begin to run from God under the impression that he is not worthy of our love, our adoration, our praise, because he is fundamentally self-serving and not on our side. So we add characteristics now. The Luciferian mind traffics in, we noticed from Revelation 12, politics and deception, and now we notice from the Isaiah text that the devil operates on the premise of self-exaltation and projection. He himself is oriented toward a deeply embedded narcissism that he projects onto God as if God were the narcissist. Actually, some of you have experienced this in your human relations. (laughs) Because this is the thing that shows up in all dysfunctional relationships. People project on others what they're not willing to take responsibility for in themselves. But that's for another message. So we come back now to Revelation chapter 12 and we call attention to the fact, as I said earlier, asked you to remember, that Satan in the text is a word, a name, a designation that means adversary or enemy, accuser. 
And Michael is the primary opponent in the text. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Notice there's a fight, there's war, and there's a fight. What is the nature of the fight? Well, we've just noticed, listen carefully now, we've just noticed the nature of the Luciferian game, politics, deception, self-centeredness and projection. Listen. So how would you logically deduce from the text of Scripture that Michael is fighting? The devil's fighting with deception. Michael then would be fighting with truth. Somebody said, yeah. If the devil's M.O. is to misrepresent the character of God, Michael, the defender of God, would take up the challenge to rightly represent the character of God. And fascinatingly enough, the name Michael, which originates in Hebrew, it's the Hebrew scriptures that give us the name Michael that shows up in its transliteration in the New Testament. But listen carefully now. Michael is a very unique Hebrew name because it is a name literally that poses a question. Who is like God? Because in the context of the great controversy, what really is the question pending in the universe? What is God really like? Lucifer's entire MO, the nature of his game, is to distort people's perception of the character of God and thereby to send them running from God into his arms while he misrepresents himself as benevolent and good. So it makes total sense that Michael, the defender of the character of God, would step up to the plate and pose the question that is embedded in the name itself, who is like God? Is Lucifer rightly representing the character of God and the claims and accusations, the charges that he's making, or is God other than Lucifer is representing? Now, we don't have time to go into this right now, but you can explore the identity of Michael that I won't unpack right now. I'm gonna simply suggest to you that scripture bears out that Michael is the name that is born by the person we know as Christ before he comes to this world, but this is a crucial distinction. He's not an angel or a created being. This is simply the name he bears to designate his primary action in the great controversy, and that is to defend and to vindicate and to exonerate the character of God. He's not a created being. Jesus is God in the flesh. We don't have time to flesh that out right now, but you can look into that further. So when Jesus comes to the world and is incarnate in human flesh, this is fascinating now. Watch this. This is a direct reference to the great controversy. Jesus is speaking to his disciples as he knows that right around the corner is the crucifixion. He's going to give his life. He's going to be crucified by a collusion of church and state, by the way. Religious leaders and political leaders on both ends of the spectrum, both liberal and conservative, who have one vital thing in common. They all hate each other, which really makes them on the same team. And you have Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Roman legions, the political and the religious elite, joining together to crucify personified love in Christ. When Jesus is looking forward to his crucifixion, he says, very interestingly, follow him, he says, now, now refers to the Calvary event that's about to happen. Now is the judgment of this world. The word judgment here, so fascinating, simply means discernment. When a judgment takes place in a court of law, for example, what is really, what is it that the judge and the jury are after? What are they after? The truth in the case, yes? And so when a judgment is made, the word judgment is a word that literally can be a synonym for discernment. Like if you say, I have a friend, her name is Judy, and she has great discernment. You might also just as readily say, oh, Judy has good judgment when it comes to people. 
Judgment is discernment. Now is the judgment, the unveiling, the disclosure. The truth is about to be known. The judge, the jury, the whole universe leaning in. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, a term for Lucifer, the fallen one, the ruler of this world will be, will be, will be at Calvary, the Calvary event will be cast out. Wait a minute, will be cast out? I thought he was cast out in the previous scripture that we read. Hold on, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to me. Notice, the devil is cast out, and simultaneously by the Calvary event, everyone is drawn, not pushed, not manipulated, not forced, not coerced, but drawn, attracted, allured. Wow, astounding, look at that. And voluntarily leaning in toward him. Cast out, well I thought he was cast out. Well, he was cast out physically from his position and place among the heavenly host, but now at the cross of Calvary, he is cast out of the affections, the thinking and feeling process, the ideology, the philosophy, the theology. He's cast out. Calvary shows us something about God that releases us, that liberates us from the lies and the, the deception that Satan has opposed upon our minds so that we are drawn, attracted, allured to God voluntarily by his love. And Paul comments on the Calvary event in a great controversy context with these words in Colossians 2.15, that at the cross event, what Jesus did is he disarmed, note the language, he disarmed the powers and authorities, that is the powers and authorities of darkness, of evil. He disarmed them he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The cross disarmed the devil, disarmed by the cross. Jesus at Calvary took away from the devil the legitimacy of the arguments and accusations against the character of God which is simply to say that the cross was, listen everybody, a revelatory event. It brought things to light and clarity. What did it bring to light and clarity? Well, the cross achieved two monumental accomplishments. Number one, the cross exposed Satan for who he really is and was at the cross. His mask was dropped, his disguise was torn away from his face, from his character, and the cross revealed the malignity, the hatred, the violence that was all along seething just beneath the surface in his heart, in his mind. So the cross exposed Satan's selfishness and simultaneously revealed God's selfless love as Jesus dies with non-violent love. No retaliation, just Father, forgive them. They're confused. They're deceived. They don't know who we really are, Father. They don't know who we are. And so the great controversy between good and evil is in the final analysis. It is a cosmic clash between love and and selfishness. When we look into the Luciferian psychology as revealed in Scripture, we see deception, political intrigue, we see self exaltation and the projecting of selfishness onto God. And in the person of Christ, we see that God is love always and forever in the most beautiful sense imaginable. And when in Christ we see his love, we're drawn, we're attracted voluntarily. We come to him, not because we must, not because we have to, but because we want to. 
because he's good. And we have come to believe in our minds and hearts that he only ever has our best interest at heart. Father in heaven, you are incredibly beautiful and we love you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we wanna encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we wanna invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.